Wharton, whose heroines were tragically circumscribed and at the mercy of society and convention in the way that McCarthy's Vassar Girls had already escaped. Both these novelists, Wharton and McCarthy, write from a distinctly anthropological and sociological perspective. Both are, in their way, intellectual aristocrats, and in McCarthy's case, what we would now call a public intellectual. And they both used fiction in the same way to explore the frontiers and the future of female experience. The women novelists of the 1940s and 1950s, as represented in this country by writers such as Barbara Pym and Elizabeth Taylor, many of whom have been rediscovered and reprinted by Nicola Bowman of Persephone Books, tended to cast their characters in what later perpetuated itself as the Anita Bruckner manner. Middle-class wives and spinsters, underoccupied, sometimes meddling, sometimes voyeuristic. I reread a lot of Barbara Pym last year, she really was very voyeuristic. They're always looking through, her characters are looking through other people's windows at what's going on inside. Very, very strange and interesting. When I started to write in the 60s, I was keen to differentiate myself from these writers and was somewhat offended when bracketed with them by critics and readers. I now read them with much more interest than I did then because the historical distance is greater. During my writing life, which now spans 30, 50 years, the opportunities for women in real life and in fiction have expanded beyond recognition, way beyond those of Wharton, and even beyond those of the advanced and progressive Mary McCarthy. In my trilogy of 1980s novels, beginning with The Radiant Way in 1987, I was aware that my three fictitious female friends, old college friends, as it were, all Nunamites, could be enjoying satisfying and profitable lives and that through their different perspectives, professional perspectives, I could portray their era. One is a successful and indeed fashionable psychoanalyst, one is a social worker and one an art historian, neatly representing the Freudian, the Marxist and the aesthetic perceptions of our age. There is nothing at all improbable about that, that such three women should be friends and should have studied together. I couldn't have written that book in the 60s, though I could write it in the 80s. I now know more of a continuity between the interests of McCarthy's characters and mine. There is a continuity, but the times have changed and we have moved on. My fellow novelists will recognise the sense of satisfaction which comes when one thinks of a character with an interesting work life which enables the writer to explore new material and to lead a proxy life. And there are some women novelists in this room at whom I could stare if I could locate them now, because I know that they have found these very satisfactions and extensions. You could find another life as a marine biologist, or a trade union lawyer, or a vulcanologist, or an anthropologist, or a property developer, or a prisoner. Or, in one of my more adventurous efforts, as a sewer man working for Thames Water, whole new worlds awaited me, um, beneath Piccadilly, in the underground drains, beneath Buckingham Palace. It was a big adventure, being allowed to go down the sewers by the Metropolitan Water Board. I was talking about careers, creating careers for characters the other day, to my Newnham friend, the novelist Bernadine Bishop, who as Bernadine Wall read English with me here, and she disclosed the satisfaction she'd felt when deciding that one of her characters should be a dermatologist. Why not? Suddenly, with a seemingly random, though not, of course, random decision, her character, Julia, became a real person, with a real life, with a real speciality, and a life outside the pages of the book. We have not moved on into equality. Women's lives are still subject to particular constraints, but the novel continues to explore those constraints, to argue against them and to push against the boundaries. I feel that I have been part of a great and ongoing exploration. It's been a great adventure a series of great adventures. I've watched with interest and amusement Helen Fielding's 
recreation of the courtship novel of Jane Austen with Bridget Jones in the 1990s. A new word, chiclet, was coined to describe this genre by, by media who were simultaneously keen to promote and diminish women's fiction with marketing phrases like chiclet, mums lit, shopping lit, and now granny lit. <laughs> but if we look at Bridget Jones seriously, as we should, we see Fielding was writing a classic courtship novel, exploring the new etiquette of relationships in a world of one-night stands and mobile phones. And ringback. She was very obsessed by ringback, which was a new phenomenon. I didn't even know what ringback was until I read Bridget Jones. And then I discovered you could do it. I think it's the thing where you ring 1471 and you see who has or has not been after you. So you learn a lot from the novel, cooking and how to use your telephone. <laughs> Times change, roles change, and women writers continue to chart the changes. Helen Fielding, with what we learnt to call the singletons. Helen Simpson, one of my favourite current writers, with young mothers. And Bernadine Bishop, my friend, with the generation of the grandmothers. While I was looking into the subject of careers and women, and exploring the links between classical studies and archaeology and anthropology, which as you see have haunted me, I looked up the lives of some of our Newnham predecessors in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, which we can now search so cleverly by profession, by gender and by place of education, and I found there so many ideas for novels as yet unwritten and for stories waiting to be told or retold. What of Ella Armitage, 1841 to 1931, described in her student days as tall and stately, with magnificent hair worn in a plaited coronet, and a serious and slightly forbidding expression to some? Or Dorothy Garrett, whose first major explanation was at the Devil's Tower, Gibraltar, where she found the middle Paleolithic Mousterian flint industry, known from her French studies, thereafter a central interest, and five skull fragments of a Neanderthal child. Though, this, though she was not a woman given to sentiment, this discovery made a deep impression, and she gave the child the resonant name of Abel, recording the date of his disinterment, age at death and probable age, before the present, 22,000 years, and in her private photograph album, he, he survives. The rare ability shown in the digging and publication, 1928, of the site, established her place in Paleolithic studies. She was appointed the only woman and youngest member to the International Commission charged in 1927 with investigating the notorious Glozell aff affair, which was an affair of potential fraud. Now there is a plot for you, a once and future plot, a female version perhaps of Angus Wilson's great novel, Anglo-Saxon Attitudes, which as those of you who know it will recall, is about a tilt-down man style archaeological fraud. To come back to Newnham, to remain with Newnham, but with our female novelists, the connection between Newnham, as was said in our introduction, has been very strong and very fruitful. Virginia Woolf threw down the gauntlet in 1928, and since then, women writers have continued to work in the form of the novel. Um, known to some of us here, indeed some of us are these people, uh, A.S. Byatt, Janet Burroway, Margot Shakespeare, Bernadine Bishop, a late recruit in Joan Bakewell, Valerie Grosvenor Meyer, who wrote one very wacky novel, <laughs> Sarah Dunant, Sally Vickers. They have upheld Newnham's literary tradition, and tomorrow you're going to hear from Jen Ashworth and Patricia Dunker. It's a very rich and um, proud tradition, and I'm very happy to have belonged to it. But I'm going to take the, priv the speaker's privilege of just concluding with a final paragraph about um, my friend Bernadine, with whom I was um, a fellow student, and whose new novel, she published two novels in the 1960s, which she then 
got rather bored with, decided not to go on with writing fiction. It was easy, she'd published to why bother. She became a teacher of English in the North London School. Then she decided to become a psychotherapist. She became a psychotherapist, a very successful and distinguished psychotherapist. And then about two years ago, she was struck down with a very serious illness. She became housebound, she had to give up her practice. So what did she do? She just wrote another novel or two. <laughs> the most extraordinary energy, um, an intrepid character. And um, they have been published, her first two novels have been published, stuck together in, um, under the title Unexpected Lessons in Love, which is, in my view, a little bit of a girly title but publishers thought it would sell to women readers. I am going to speak up very strongly for this novel. I urge you all to go and buy it, because the novel is about Bernadine's illness, and she is very ill, and nothing cheers her up more than knowing somebody's bought her novel. So I just, I will bring along a copy tomorrow, I will present one to the library, and I will show it all to you. But it is a very fine novel, and it is an example of how in the novel we can look into the future, we can create a future. Bernadine is my age, we are in our 70s, but we don't give up. When we're young, we explore being young. <coughs> when we have children, we try and create new models of surviving as a mother. When we're middle-aged, we look at middle age. And when we are old, we explore being old, we don't get into it, we continue to explore it, we continue to push the boundaries of the knowable. I'm so full of admiration for this book, and I do recommend it. Adam Mars Jones said it should have been published under its original title, which was Gut Feelings, mm -hmm. but I think there was some recoil from the kind of basic nature of that oh. title, but it is used as a subtitle. In fact, I now can tell you that the first part of this novel is called Gut Feelings, and the second part is called Shit Scared. <laughs> How we have moved on. And some of you may have heard Bernadine discussing the colostomy and the stoma on woman's eye with Jenny Murray last uh, month. Now, we have moved on in our subject matter. We have created a future, partly through fiction itself, in, we are, in which we are not afraid to look at our bodies, not afraid to seek careers. So I leave you with that thought. I am at the end of my career. Some of you here are at the beginning, but the future is all before us. Thank you all very much. Thank you.